and I think all of us need to figure out how we are going to build those stories, bring stories, and we are going to tell those stories, then sell those stories. So it's not storytelling. I sometimes call it as selling. My team is involved in two kinds of questions. Right, one is are we building the right product, and are we doing it in the right way? To me, anyone who has an impact on customer experience or product experience. Uh-huh. An Apple tends to worry more about the form, whereas an Amazon is ruthlessly functional. First of all, you're not comparing apples and apples. <laughs> <laughs> apples and Amazon. <laughs> so, Abhijit, good evening and welcome to the Yellow Cloud series. Thank you, Saurabh. It's a pleasure to see you again and uh, talk to you again. And uh, it's, awesome, it's be here. I realize that we go back twenty years. Um, you know, I started my career in two thousand four as a UX professional, and you were my first manager. Wow, I remember that. Forget <laughs> my <laughs> My first lessons in process orientation in getting a strategic understanding of a problem came from you. So thank you for that, for kind of laying the foundation, you know, for the beginning of my uh, UX design career. You know, as I was uh, discussing with the team, the Yellow Couch team, uh, you know, who we can talk to uh, about design leadership and scale, uh, you know, I couldn't think of anyone better than you, Abhijit, to kind of complete that circle for me, at least, because you know, uh, started there and now to have that conversation again with you to talk about design, uh, scale, impact, leadership. Yeah, well, uh, before we do that, right, I must say that, you know, you, I remember the time when you joined the team and I think you were as prepared as you are today. <laughs> uh, it, it just made my job easy. Uh, oh, and that's thank you. Manager. Great. So, so let's jump right in. Um, you know, over the years doing UX design work, I have realized that the terms leadership, scale, impact are not necessarily spoken in the same sentence with design. Uh, in some parts of the world, yes, some, some organizations, yes, but in large parts of the world, not yet. And so we, you know, we felt that this was a very important topic to discuss mm-hmm. with you, uh, you know, somebody who's uh, kind of holding the flag for design leadership at Amazon uh, and, of course, your journey as a designer over the years. So I guess I wanted to start off by asking you, how do you define the leadership in the design context? And what are some of the qualities that you feel are really important for uh, leading any kind of designer? No, a great question, and thanks for... Uh... Getting started with the Joe, the Joe, to answer your question, right? That's about design and about leadership. Uh, I think the way I look at it, uh, sort of, uh, is that you know, when you talk about leadership, right, of any kind, I think we need to draw any prefix that it comes with, right? To me, design leadership is essentially just a leadership. Yeah, you have to come from a design function, that's your specialty, that's your background. But ultimately, when you are a leader, you are a leader for everyone that you work with. That includes your team, design team, and that includes the team that you work with who may not be reporting to you, but you work with them on a day-to-day basis. And in many cases, you have to kind of provide and extend your leadership to, uh, to to your upper management as well, right? So because you are the one, you are the voice of the customer, you are the voice of the wine. And uh, you need to understand your own superpower or that you are one leader. But uh, you come across as a, as, a, as a court leader, as a champion for design or for all the, not just your own team, right? So, so Abhijit, can I just ask a follow-up? I've always felt that designers have this imposter syndrome yes. when it comes to accepting the word leadership. Why is that? My uh, observation is that there is a bit of a hesitation when it comes to ownership. When you talk about ownership, I'm talking about a single-threaded ownership uh, of 
on the design, right? And its impact and its value and its ability to kind of demonstrate its ROI. Uh, I think it's end-to-end -end ownership of design, right? And to some extent, uh, designers, as you rightly put it, it's that imposter syndrome that, you know, uh, well, I'm, whatever I'm doing, whatever I'm bringing is not enough for me to really, you know, own it and drive it uh, for, the, for the organization, right? Uh, I think uh, to some extent that hesitation uh, comes from uh, from from that, uh, which is uh, to to me, uh, you know, one of my professors at Stanford very put it correctly he says that uh, you know whatever has got you here will not get you there. Right? Your design background, your design experience, obviously has you know, got you to a to a point where you are leading design for for a product or for a team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, or what's next, right? How do you kind of really scale your impact? How do you kind of really come across as a leader for your organization? I think that is very, very good. I think the other thing that uh, very often is expected from leaders and, and specifically from, say, design leaders, since you, since you asked that question, right, it is about uh, adding to that product thinking, right? Are you really holistically bringing design uh, to the table for the company? Mm -hmm. Are you really adding to the product thinking or are you still kind of buried in mm -hmm. and what craft and tools that you are using, right? What are some of the challenges that the product is facing in the market? Uh, what are some of the headwinds and the tailwinds that the business is facing? And how are you aligning your activities in support of that, right? So that becomes very, very critical. And uh, for Really understanding, uh, you know, your business, right? You know, how what's the business model of your company? How does the company make money? Uh, you know, how, what is the go-to-market plan for your product? Uh, how do you sell the product? How do the customers integrate that product? So having that little holistic view on the product is very, very important. And that's what I call it product thinking, uh, and that picked it from the designers, and that's how we will appeal appeal the design leadership. So obviously, you talked about ownership. Right. Do you think it's simply about the fact that when it comes to owning the business metrics that are related to the success of a product, they typically don't tend to be in the design leaders kind of KPI? Is that one of the reasons why there is that distance from really owning the outcome? You know, I've been asked to do that question very often in some of the orgs that I work with, right? And uh, I've also seen orgs which are kind of going, uh, you know, their design teams kind of come up with their own key OKRs. To be honest, I think that's where you start uh, moving away from really impacting the company and trying to kind of see your bubble, right? Mm. Because uh, it always baffles me that how can a design team have a separate set of KPIs, which are not like yeah. KPIs. Right. So I would definitely not encourage anyone to kind of create your own set of KPIs. Of course, there are a set of things that you want to do as a as a hygiene thing for running a design practice, right? And you want to focus on the career development of your team and you know their own growth and some of the impactful work that you want to do, which is more inward facing. But when it comes to your OKRs or KPIs, uh, I think they all need to align to whatever the North Star metric is for your or for their company, right? And it has to be one single not submitted for the entire company, right? Everything will be roll up in those KPIs, right? And those KPIs are obviously tied very tightly to, to the business goals, right? Right. And then it can change from, you know, based on where the company is in its own life cycle, right? Mm. The company is like, if you're working for a startup, you know, your, your KPIs are different than you're working for an established startup or a mid-sized company. Versus you're working for established uh, enterprise, yeah. right? Uh, so you need to understand what are those business objectives, what is it that a company is trying to achieve. At the same time, understand what the long-term vision is. Uh, Abhishek, how often do you see uh, the CDO role now in organization? Is that like a norm now in the US at least? Not really. I mean, uh, just the example of the company that I work for, we do not have CEO. And to be honest, I think, uh, you know, there are very few companies uh, where that uh, model, top-down model has really worked. Mm. Uh, the reality in today's world with that, you know, these enterprises are a collection of different businesses and different products, different uh, teams, right? Uh, and uh, uh, very often the teams are highly decentralized. 
and having the CDO function sometimes is is, is not in the favor of really uh, providing that type of business agility, right? Uh, so you take a bank, any large bank, uh, they have got a consumer facing business, they have uh, investment banking side of things, they have mortgage. Well, uh, all these are fairly uh, more different businesses. Uh, also trying to serve different points of customers, right? Like in some cases, you are serving institutional customers. In some cases, you are serving uh, retail customers, right? So having one single CEO, uh, of course, it makes sense to have a one single unified CEO, but it yeah. may you'll also see that there are separate CEOs running in most separate mm. as well. And there is always that debate whether should the uh, design team be uh, a centralized team uh, or should the design team be DPM, but yeah. Uh, or teams. The opinion in the industry is divided. If you ask me for my own opinion, I think uh, I would love to have design which is deeply, closely embedded with the business team, right? Instead of trying to forcefully centralize, centralize them. Mm. Uh, I would rather, because sometimes when you're the moment you're centralized and you're, uh, you know, you're acting as a shared services team, uh, right? Uh, and that, that kind of distances, distances you in design team from the actual business uh, decisions. I'm not saying that the, that the designers need to report into different business leaders. The designers can still report into a centralized design function. Yeah. But uh, their alignment should be with respect to the business unit. So you're saying a hybrid structure? It's pretty much a hybrid model, a matrix model, however you want to call it. Uh, I know uh, I personally hate this uh, this concept of a solid line and a dotted line. <laughs> but that's a reality in today's world, right? Uh, as long as you are very clear about, uh, you know, which one is the solid, solid line and which one is the dotted line and how thick are those lines. Are, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm, and establishing that very clearly is very, very critical so that there is no good in terms of owns uh, which part of the business and the decision that come along with it. So Abhijit, you worked with various companies as an employee. You've also consulted with a whole host of diverse set of companies. Uh, first, your experience on the inside, right? Working as a design leader across organizations. How has the Amazon experience been different compared to the other experiences? I think uh, every organization is unique or it has its own culture uh, and it has its own uh, story uh, in terms of how the company is of developing itself, right? Uh, at Amazon, obviously, you know, there are a lot of stories that people hear about Amazon and how Amazon is just an option. It's a lot of that is, is something that I experience day, day in, day out. I think it's really the speed and the scale at which the thinking is encouraged at Amazon, right? And that, that kind of makes Amazon were uh, an exciting and uh, interesting place for someone like me who is uh, looking at you know, how do I can really scale uh, the impact of my work uh, and how do I contribute to solving problems of tomorrow, right? So it really gives, at least has given me that kind of a very broad canvas to, to explore and uh, exercise my experience in the field of design and also extend my thought leadership to my broad partners. It's it's a very different uh, place in many ways. Uh, it encourages a lot of experimentation. It, uh, it it pushes the ownership down to the teams working in the trenches, very close to the customer experience. Uh, and that kind of makes the work very, very, very interesting uh, because you're constantly learning, uh, plus having leadership principles, which are... Uh, probably known across the globe, right? Uh, Jet B, all those. Uh, and that kind of provides a structure or scaffolding for, for the entire company to operate, right? So although we are highly decentralized teams, it's very easy for me to connect with other product teams or other design teams within Amazon because we all use the same language. Uh, we all exhibit the same leadership principles and behavior that come along with it, right? So uh, it, it just becomes a common language. Uh, at the same time, it allows us to kind of basically speed up our decision making. Yeah. Right. So Abhijit, when you talk about speed, give me a sense of you know how fast is fast. Oh uh, yeah, uh, it can be dazzling uh, to <laughs> you know, 
uh, in, in many ways, right? You know, some of the work that we do and some of the decisions that we take uh, in a matter of weeks uh, has taken multiple months, in some cases, a couple of years in my previous orgs. Kind of a speed you know, that uh, at which at which I'm right. Well, I think that well, that's what makes things exciting. Of course, uh, you know we we do have uh, a, a structure in place uh, which allows us to to make sure that you know, we are uh, we have not been breaching. Right. Mm-hmm. But is there, is there tolerance for like moving fast, of course, but then failing fast? Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent, right? So uh, and that's the reason we have uh, our own uh, uh, you know mechanisms that we have, like uh, you know writing TRFAQ, which is a public we don't public readings and and our FAQ and or uh, doing the prototyping and doing validation with the customers. With those tools and mechanisms, it's easy to validate your product idea, your business idea, and and make changes. Right? Or in some cases, just drop it because you know you know that you know things have uh, it's already an idea or it, it doesn't make sense for Amazon to invest into a particular idea as a business, right? Uh, we have a concept of one-way door decisions and two-way door decisions. Right? Okay. Uh, so one-way door decisions are the ones that have direct impact on the customer trust, all right? So those decisions, uh, of course, kind of go through a lot of scrutiny, uh, and because those are expensive decisions. And there are two old decisions where you know the cost of reversing a decision is low, interest is low, right? So, uh, and those decisions are passed on further down to the team, right? Because anyone can take two, uh, uh, right? A designer can take a two way door decision, whether it's going to be a new button or an orange button, because right. that's to uh, have a major impact on the customer trust. But if it's about pricing of a product, then that's a one way door decision. No, it's very interesting. As a as a design philosophy, I would ask you something about that. Like to an outsider, to a layman, it feels that you know, if I was to take an example of an apple, right? An apple tends to worry more about the form, right? They're more form oriented, whereas an Amazon is, I don't know, maybe ruthlessly functional. Am I am I right in this kind of? analysis or that's just the uh, perception no it's a it's a great question right and uh, uh, fortunately i did uh, study uh, at the stanford school of business there yeah. school of business and uh, now i can relate how to respond to a question like that right <laughs> okay. in a more structured way right so i think if you compare these two companies right first of all you're not comparing apples and apples <laughs> <laughs> Apples and Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think uh, there are companies with different uh, business models, right? Mm. So there are companies which focus on, for example, if you look at something like Apple, and especially the Steve Jobs philosophy of protection, right? It's about product excellence. And then there are companies like Amazon where, of course, product excellence is important, but then also there is operational efficiency and operational excellence. Similarly, from the other uh, large companies, right, they have a focus on you know, uh, customer service, right? Mm. That's really the core of a company, uh, what company stands for, and uh, you know, kind of reflect that into your business model. Mm. So these are two different flavors, essentially. Two different flavors, absolutely. And and it's about being true to who you are, your ethos, and then just kind of going for that. Rather than trying to be someone you're not. Exactly. Right. I mean, you can compare that with companies like, say, Ferrari and Toyota, right? Both are hugely successful. Yeah. Uh, very different product positioning, different uh, target segment, uh, different market that they're trying to penetrate, uh, and just the brand and the way they kind of come across. Uh, it's a very interesting way to answer this question because when people compare digital experiences, right? From the outside, they think they're comparing apples to apples, right? Yeah. And an Amazon digital experience versus an Apple digital experience, you know, they're just looking at that and and thinking, okay, one is like this, the other is like this. Why is that? And so, thank you for answering that. I think that's that's really well said. Now, jumping back into design leadership, you know, with the last year, you know, the generative AI. How do you see design leadership in the context of this new dynamic 
on the scene and how do you see this evolving in the next five years? I think what we are going to see in experience in the next five years is there will be at least 10x of what change of their experience in the last five years. Well, uh, I know we don't have an equivalent of a Moose law. Uh, it means, well, when they should be. <laughs> exactly, right? I that's think, a great uh, point. Yeah, I think that's that's what I anticipate that's going to happen uh, uh, in the next five years. So we have already seen how uh, uh, you know, some of the mega trends have changed uh, the landscape uh, of business and consumers alike. Right? Mm. Uh, I think that is going to be a big change. One of the things that I've noticed with uh, this emerging technology and, and the eagerness to adopt these technologies to change uh, is really focused more on the business model innovation that we've seen in the market. Mm. Uh, uh, it just unleashes uh, uh, a completely new way of doing business. Uh, you know, some of the traditional companies are going to completely change and transform their business model. Like, uh, they're reading many other ways. Uh, some of your traditional revenue channels are going to shrink along this. So that means you will be forced to think about new revenue channels and think about how we can transform your business to adopt the new reality. Do you think we'll still be dealing with a lot of screen design kind of problems or do you see voice-based interactions really coming to the fore? Uh, I mean, I know there's this, you know, there was a product um, that uh, got launched about two, three months back, Rabbit. Oh, really? There was a lot of buzz around that, and I have my opinions on that. But I wanted to kind of ask you, in as you see the next five years and the changes that are going to happen, tactically, tactically, what does that mean for the footprints and, you know, the interaction modalities? The screens will be there. Uh, I would say the screens will be everywhere. Right. Uh, it's definitely going to be a multimodal world. Uh, now we won't see uh, the way we interact with Ted uh, and the way Ted interacts with us. Right Right now it's more we reaching out to Ted. I think uh, you'll see a reverse of some of that where they yeah. reaching out to us and from us. Like us. Yeah. Uh, you know, and nudging us. Uh, uh, in a, hopefully in a seamless way. Mm. Uh, and we will see a lot of that. Uh, yes, uh, voice-based interactions uh, will be more mainstream, more common. Uh, but I expect uh, that the screens will have their own space. Uh, I think the context of our workspace is going to change. Right? Uh, imagine that right now we are sitting at a bar, we are facing the front, uh, we are facing the dashboard, we are looking through the picture. Imagine that now those things exist mm-hmm. in God is autonomous. Yeah. Right? So there is no front, there is no back, and you could be facing each other in a car. Yeah. So what 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 would that experience and that mm-hmm. so use uh, what does that mean to have uh, an interface? Right. So that's going to change quite a bit. Uh, I think AI, I think we, what we have seen over the last 15, 20 years with digitization is a lot of uh, automation. Uh, I think what we are going to see in the next five years is a lot of, we are moving from automation to autonomous. Interesting. And that's a, that's a big difference, right? Right now, um, I still, I'm interacting with this as one and still kind of taking certain decisions. I still need to kind of accept the receipt. Uh, a lot of the tasks that we do on day-to-day basis will be uh, will be autonomous. So they are just happening. You don't even have to think about those tasks, right? They are just happening, and the technology reaches out to you only when it needs a human intervention. Mm. Mm. Now that will open up a very different set of you know, interaction paradigms that we need to design for. Right now, because it's a new shiny object, uh, right? It's like, you know, everyone is jumping onto it. I think one of the fascinating things that's going to happen for, for the field of research and design is to be finding out those use cases which are transformative in nature, right? Which are going to truly seamlessly integrate this new tech into 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 the user lives and going to completely transform those experiences, right? Um, I want to be careful not using the word delight here. Because 
the evidence of that. But uh, you can you can also create delightful moments. Uh, and I think the delightful moments will come not from the interactions, but from the lack of interaction. Right? That's, that's really interesting. Right, the and lack of interaction. The lack of interaction is where you create delight because then I'm I, I'm not thinking about technology, I'm just thinking about my. Life. So that actually brings me to my next question. So if the lack of interaction is going to be a new metric for user delight, what role do design leaders play in that new ecosystem? To be honest, I think the jury is still out in terms of how <laughs> do uh, how this is going to impact uh, or change our profession uh, on the creative front in general. It just makes our profession much more interesting, right? Because there will be more opportunities for people to come up with creative use of all these technologies. Uh, I anticipate it's going to create new user personas that we have not that thought about. So that will require more research. That will require uh, you know more testing. That will require uh, more design, right? Or so more, you know, not less. More, I would say, definitely more, but not less. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's just that I think a lot of our uh, heuristics that we use that we have been using for last maybe maybe forty years, uh, some of those heuristics will need to be refreshed. Uh, there will be new uh, research and new. Models, metal models, uh, new mechanisms that will that will get developed, interaction paradigms will get developed, uh, and that will become the new norm uh, for the for the next generation of interfaces. So, obviously, as a design leader, if you had to prepare up and coming aspiring design leaders for the next five years, uh, what do they need to have in their arsenal to be ready? For this new world, I'm going to give you my perspective in terms of how I see uh, this uh, evolving, right, and how this uh, these trends uh, which are going to change uh, change the way the designers will operate uh, in tomorrow's world. Going back to what I said right in the beginning, right, uh, that understanding, having that understanding of business thinking, understanding the evolving business model is something that we. Are Right on the designs, right? You look at even a hundred-year-old industry like banking; it has changed for the last years. Uh, it's going to completely transform uh, as we speak. Right? So, business understanding, business understanding, okay, deeper business appreciation understanding. Okay, absolutely. absolutely. And and we understand how the business models are evolving. Right. So, I know change is going to be important. The second thing that I would say is going to be uh, a domain understanding, right? Mm. Having a deeper understanding and appreciation of what are the some of the durable industry trends that are evolving, whether it's healthcare, whether it's travel, hospitality, whether it is uh, high tech. So you uh, say deeper understanding, Abhijit, but I've always heard about the T-shaped person, right? A designer being this T-shaped person, there's a sh- you know kind of a broad understanding of a lot of things. Yeah. The one understanding that we have in depth is design. And I've always heard that is a good thing because then that allows us to ask the, you know, the stupid questions, bring in fresh perspective. But you are saying you need deep expertise in a domain to be relevant. Absolutely. Uh, I think having having that kind of a industry specific understanding of, of, of because it kind of ties back to Point number one, which is the business thinking, right? So you need to kind of have that balance of yes, what's the what's the business thinking? What is what's the domain that I'm operating in or the company is operating in, right? Uh, what are some of the trends, durable trends that are emerging in that industry, right? Because each industry is going to go through a massive transformation as we speak, right? Uh, so there are not many people. If you look at even automotive. A lot today, right? Automotive industry. We have been building cars for 100 years, right? That's not how the cars are going to get built for the next 100 years. We will have to relearn how the industry operates, right? And uh, we are at a at a at a cusp of that transformation where all these industries are have to go to go and reinvent themselves. So well, it's very interesting. Now we talk about healthcare, but it's going to be a combination of 
health and maybe even insurance together. I don't know what that industry, what what we are going to call that industry, right? Imagine that you, know, you have your pharma companies, your health systems, and your insurance and fees going to converge. Imagine that you have a company or industry that emerges which have unifies all of these things with help of technology. What are you going to call that? So this this convergence that's going to happen is going to be very interesting, mm. and it's I guess it's up to us to connect the dots. All right, right. And some some industries will transform early. Some industries will take mm. time. We all with today we see there are industries which are still lagging in terms of their own digital transformation. When you mentioned deep expertise, I was uh, recently reading uh, about the downfall of design thinking, right and one of the critiques I read was that design thinking created a, a set of so-called design leaders that were doing design theater, not real design, because it was a very kind of shallow understanding of design and its application to a domain. Um, and so not only are we talking about deep expertise uh, for a designer to have in the domain, but I guess for businesses to also appreciate design, uh, I wanted to see what you think about the fact that design thinking is now kind of on its downward trend. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's the it's the unfortunate fallout of a uh, 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 hype cycle, right? Mm. That we have seen. Uh, I think companies and many companies uh, that I have seen and have worked with as well have tried to disrupt their uh, their own models by trying to bring in this creative energy and creative thinking into mm-hmm. the, into their yeah. uh, their transformation, right? Uh, and obviously, it was fueled by some of the big names that we hear, right? And that becomes easy because when you have one of the big consulting companies coming and talking about design thinking, right? Uh, it's easy to, to get carried away without really understanding how that is implemented, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's where it has many companies it has remained as as a tool, not as a mindset. Uh, and as you know, of being the design profession for so many years, right? Design thinking is not a uh, one or two day workshop or something that you exactly. Can yeah. Right? It's the adoption of a of a of a human centered way of working, collaboration, or across the entire top life cycle, right? And putting multi disciplinary teams together so that you know the, the ideation is holistic, prototyping is holistic, and you are coming out with best of the ideas, and then you have a free work to rapidly prototype and test and validate the ideas, mix and match the ideas, and then bring out one idea that. That you want to put all your weight behind, and then deliver. And the delivery is not the end state; it's the beginning of a product's journey. So thinking wow. about so how you are going to, how that product is going to grow, scale, get refined, you need that. So you cannot just have design thinking that's happening at the headquarter for a few months, and then it becomes business agile after you ship the product. So, so Abhijit, you're saying as a design leader. I need business acumen, I need deep expertise. And what I don't want to do is propagate this notion of shallow design thinking in organizations that actually does more damage than good. Would that be fair to say? Absolutely. In fact, recently, sort of someone asked me, uh, who's the designer mm. on your team? And I said, to me, anyone who has an impact on customer experience or product experience is a designer. Mm. That includes uh, everyone, right, from my sales to my customer support. Mm-hmm. Everyone in between, right, right, because essentially you are having some kind of impact on the customer. In some cases, if you think of an engineer, engineer, of course, we have we use all these labels to differentiate between different job families. Mm-hmm. But even engineer is a designer, right, because the choices that they are making about the back-end or the front-end technologies are having a direct impact yeah. on how the customer experience comes so, so either you're doing it consciously with exactly. awareness or it's just an ad hoc kind of right. unconscious thing. And I guess that's what separates doing design as a discipline or just impacting customer experience without knowing. 
Well, absolutely. Even a product manager who is uh, doing the backlog grooming, he has actually from the customer experience. Yeah. The experience. So yeah. we know many ways the product manager is also a designer because they are prioritizing which features get released. And mm-hmm. So in a sense that you're saying that design is not the sole property of designers. A design is a is a mindset, is a impact mechanism or a mechanism of change that is uh, everyone's responsibility. 100%, right? But we need to be careful because when we say it's everyone's responsibility. Yeah, there's a flip side. <laughs> right? yeah. So I still want designers to kind of really quote that, uh, you know, mm. we, are the, we are the custodians. But yeah. the same, making sure that, you know, uh, we are lending the help and guidance and guide trains. Uh, to the other teams and making sure that, like you said, right, a lot of people don't realize they think that they are doing engineering and they have nothing to do with UX and design. Yes. Reality is that they are in the now. Exactly. Exactly. Right? exactly. So making sure that you you help them see that line of sight between their work and the impact on the customer experiences. So do you tend to do this uh, a lot in your day-to-day work, like helping kind of break the myths around design? Or is that something that is kind of pretty well understood at, at Amazon? Uh, I would say it depends, right? Uh, I think, you know, Amazon is just a expression of, you know, how what we see in the industry otherwise, where there are, there are teams, where there are people who really get it, there are people who don't get it. And I'm not saying because they don't want to know it, right? It's, I think well, what I've realized is that it's, it's not, no one has a bad intention of bad product. Uh, it's just that they don't know what they don't know. And then that in that case, it becomes my and my team's responsibility to, to take those people, bring those people along uh, and help them and sometimes speak and kind of unpack your process, invite them into your process. It's sort of doing a handoff. I call it as a handshake, right? So you do a handshake with engineering or you do a handshake with the product management. So there is an overlap uh, between your activities and your deliverables, right? So that's how you will kind of educate, uh, you will influence people, you will educate people or to understand why you are insisting on certain way of doing, doing design. And I'm sure a big part of that is how you communicate, right? How you, what words you choose, how do you articulate the design intervention you're doing? And so what advice would you give to designers and design leaders and how to better communicate the value of design or even the business value of design? I think the first and foremost is uh, just asking the initial question. Wow. Right? So I think mm. asking questions is the most powerful form of communication. Super. Right? And asking yes. inform, informed questions is very important, right? So try and understand what is, again, going back, I, I might sound like I'm repeating myself here, but, uh, you know, understand, ask them questions about how do you make money? How does this product make money, right? Uh, how do you sell this product? Who's buying this product? Why do they buy this product? Why do they pay for it? What features do they pay for? How are they integrating this product? So by asking questions, you are, you are, you are, you are seen as a trusted partner who are already, okay, you are saying that, hey, you are not just there to design things without really and how the design comes together in form of a, of a business. So uh, I think asking questions, asking me bringing questions is the first important. I have also often seen, going back to a very first point, right, imposter syndrome, right? Very often I feel that the designers are just not asking questions. Right. Uh, because they may think that these questions are not intelligent or they don't understand. Yes. But in fact, if you don't understand it, that's even even the reason that you should be asking those questions. Right? So you said asking intelligent questions. Okay. But then I guess uh, we also uh, tend to ask a lot of existential kind of, you know, uh, foundational questions. So how do you get over this notion of, oh, this is not intelligent enough, can I really ask? And because that's probably one of the reasons why people stop themselves for from articulating a question there. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I, I would say 
don't overthink whether you're asking an intelligent question or you're not. You're asking a stupid question, right? The answer will tell you whether it was an intelligent question or a stupid question. So, uh, so uh, I think uh, asking questions is more important rather than you know, thinking whether those are intelligent questions. If you want to ask questions, you should be able to do your job. Yeah. And it's okay to ask questions otherwise, right? Because ultimately you're a part of the company and you want to understand how the company is. Right, well, and it's a fair question because that's how everyone gets me. So it's important that you uh, you open up and you start asking those questions mm-hmm. as partners or yeah. find answers. Right, reach out to people. I think we are talking about communication. We are right. How can you, well, how can you communicate the business value mm-hmm. of design? Yeah, by right? by asking questions, you are only communicating that you care about this. Wow, right. If you, if you don't ask that question, that basically means that you are, so you are basically burning more head in the sand. Yeah. Right? Uh, so that's number one. Uh, I would also say that, you know, if you can help find answers to tough questions, then businesses forget what. That's a great way Man, to just show the value, right? And very often you go to a GM or to a VP and yeah. what, what are the hard questions that you're trying to answer? Mm-hmm. And if through your work, which was work with some work, which were able to help them, that's such out. a great question. It's yeah. an awesome question. Yeah. So I typically tend to ask those questions at the beginning of the year, whatever your financial year is, or whatever your year is, and say, hey, what is it that you want to solve this year? What are what are the questions that you have unanswered for your things? Mm-hmm. Right. And then align all your activities and that make that as your clarity, right? So all the follow-up research, design, work, prototyping that you do is kind of aligned to kind of get answers to this question, right? In some cases, you already have business has answers, but with no confidence. Your job is to improve the confidence of those answers through iterative design validation. And that's how you're kind of, you know, influencing, that's how you're communicating the value of design, right? Because if, imagine that, you know, you're... VP is studying, VP product is studying the second question. Mm. I'm not sure which direction. Mm. Then come back with some real data artifacts who support their decision making. Ultimately, it's their decision making, but you are basically yeah. supporting uh, with, yeah. with data and evidence. Right. Uh, I think creating a direct line of sight between you and work in the business of important. Like, I think we talked a little bit about the not star metric, but mm. understanding. Start metric is and then think, hey, how are asking yourself and asking team that question, right? So, all right, so if you're developing this feature, how does this feature ultimately impact our not start metric? Yeah. So, you said ask ask questions. Yes. Help uh, find answers to the tough questions yeah. and uh, develop a clear line of sight between your work and the business yeah. outcomes. So, those are the three, three, three that's a really amazing points. So, I'm going to take a cue from that and ask you, since it's still beginning of this year, what are the hard questions that you're looking to answer this year? As a design leader, I'm sure you've done that exercise for yourself. Yeah, I have. Uh, you know, and honestly, obviously, I won't be able to disclose a lot sure. of what we at Amazon, but, uh, you know, it's really about the product market fit, right? Most of uh, my, my work and my team's work is really focusing on how do you really help my product partners to find uh, their understanding of the product market fit uh, for some of the product that we're developing, right? Uh, uh, the, how can we do this more iteratively, uh, working closely with the customers? Mm-hmm. My team is involved in two kinds of questions, right? One is, are we building the right product? And are we in the right way? And the journey to answering those questions, of course, takes you through the whole process of research and iteration. This could be applied to um, a month-old startup or a hundred-year-old company and everybody in between. Absolutely. Well, I wish people would make a, a kind of a habit out of asking these two fundamental questions at every kind of key milestone of a product's journey. I think it would change the design landscape and the product landscape. I think that's really powerful. So we're almost at the end, Abhijit, and I want to kind of ask you, looking back at your evolution as a designer, 
uh, if you had to go back to 20, 25 years earlier, Abhijit, what would you tell him that, uh, you know, you think would have been a big difference? I think there are a lot of lessons. I wish I had learned much earlier in my career, uh, right? Uh, sort of, and uh, I'm sure I have a long list of things <laughs> Uh, I wish I knew uh, when I was getting started uh, as, as a designer or, or as a professional, as an engineer way back. The one that sticks out and probably comes uh, immediately to my mind is uh, the fact that everyone, everyone is in sales. I uh, think that's the reality uh, of working in the industry, working for any business, for any company, right? in any profession, any job function. Right. Mm. Everyone is in sales. Yeah. Everyone is in sales. Oh, right. Uh, uh, you are selling your sales, your portfolio, your work, uh, your idea, uh, like your team, your business, your product, your service. And when I say sales, it's not in a bad way, right? It's not in insurance. Sales. Yes, exactly. It's about insurancing people, right? And, and, and ensuring that people can rally behind your idea. That is critical. Well, and very often as a designer, you know, we think that well, it's not my job, right? I will, I can do great work and then someone else will, someone else will notice it, right? Uh, which is, which is okay, uh, uh, right? To have like, a strong belief and do some great work. Uh, at the same time, you also need to externalize and make that work visible in form of stories, in form of your work, in form of what organization method that you want to use, right? Because unless you express and unless you communicate, unless you share, uh, you are not going to do insurance anymore. Interesting. So you're saying good work doesn't sell itself. You have to sell it. Good work doesn't sell itself, 100%. You need to find sponsors. You need to find them uh, who will will support your idea, right? Um, And support you uh, in that process, right? And, uh, And and I think all of us need to figure out how we are going to build those stories, complain stories, and we are going to tell those stories, uh, then sell those stories. Right. Uh, no, mm-hmm. So it's not storytelling. I sometimes call it as story selling. Because you can tell a story, someone can use Story it. selling. <laughs> That's a good thing. Right. Because you can tell a story, but then if the story doesn't stay, and people just walk away after hearing the story. Most of the time. Yeah, I think that is, uh, that's pretty much, I think, ultimately, it's, I think understanding people uh, is, is another thing that right? I was uh, into work and I did not realize the power of networking. And it's a learned skill, uh, right? Getting your, getting out of your zone uh, and being comfortable uh, reaching out to people. Very yeah. Well. yeah, and I think the, the selling aspect and the introversion are connected, right? Exactly, mm. exactly. And I'll, I'll just to finish, right? I think uh, reaching out to people not only when you need help, but even when you don't need help, is important, right? So keeping the network alive and active is very, very important. I think uh, a lot of the opportunities that I've got, uh, and I've been very blessed to have such a wide and diverse network, is because of that. One of the things that I've started started doing about ten years back is to have lunch with a different person every day to go to the office. Wow. It could be anyone. Anyone. Anyone from any business. I've had lunch right from the teams in finance to customer services to even well, building security. This is so crazy. It's almost like I can think of this as a title for a great book by Abhijit. <laughs> lunch with a new person every day. <laughs> There's so much. Uh, yeah. You know, my mentors who gave me this idea. So they know, yeah, because we tend to build our own circle that we are comfortable with. Yes. Right. And we tend to gravitate towards people who are like us. Mm. And that basically closes all your ideas and you know, all the impressions that you can possibly get from the outside world. Right. So you want to break that you know, uh, balloon that you could have built or the glass wall that you built around yourself. But you know, when people say, hey, get out of the comfort zone, think out of the box, you know, this is such a a powerful and doable way of doing that. It's a very easy way to do it. Yeah, well, it's. I'm sure it has. There are days where you just want to like just eat your food in peace. 
But I, I mean, it's such a great hack to be able to step out of your bubble, to have interesting conversations and to take away something from every lunch meeting. Yeah, exactly. And to be able to fit in it into your day seamlessly. Yeah. You know, if there was a list of atomic habits for designers, this should be on the list. Absolutely. Right? Because it teaches you how to be a people person, how to understand human beings, how to think outside the box, um, and how to drive insight. Yeah. Uh, you know, as you go about your day observing things. Yeah. Just, uh, it, just take out your product manager tomorrow for lunch. Right? You will learn a lot. I mean, we talk about empathy. That's the best way to practice and exercise empathy. Right? That's Unbelievable. Yeah. What a great right. hack. I'm going to borrow that, Abhijit, and I'm going to do that. Yeah. I mean, we are a much smaller organization, but I think even if I hear it in a practice of choosing one new person to sit with at the lunch table, that's going to be so powerful. I want to like continue this conversation, but I know it's getting late for you. Um, Abhijit, uh, it's been such a fun conversation, right, on such a broad range of topics, but all centered around design leadership, scaling impact. Uh, I think it's really given me, um, you know, a lot of uh, tools and things to put in my personal playbook to get from where I am today to the next level. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, when you do come to India, I'm going to book my one lunch with you. And hopefully we'll be able to put you on the actual yellow couch we have here. You know, this was the virtual yellow couch, but I'm looking forward to the next one with you in person, whether in India or in the US. But uh, thank you so much for taking our time and, you know, sharing with us what you do. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, where it just brought back so many memories of working together. Oh, likewise. So do I be the work that you all are doing? Uh, uh, like your company and I would love to come and meet the team yes. and uh, definitely lunch with you. <laughs> I look forward to that. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks. Have a great evening. You too. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.